All right, well, I'm here to talk to you guys about some nautical stories. Um, we've all seen nauticals on Netflix, and, you know, now they have the new Narcos Mexico, which tackles the Guadalajara cartel and the Camarena kidnapping. But there's a lot of things wrong with the series, which I don't understand why they would go all out to um, do several seasons of, you know, Medellin and Pablo Escobar and get most of the facts straight but when it comes to mexico and the guadalajara cartel which is a cartel that a lot of people don't know about i mean they've heard of it here and there caro quintero don neto felix gallardo and all them these are the godfathers of the mexican drug trade and uh, most people don't know the origins they all know el chapo el chapo el chapo you know everything nowadays is el chapo but they don't understand where it all began so well uh, i think that with narcos mexico it was a missed opportunity because uh, they had all this information available they had all this research they had all these events and characters that could have easily been like a, a dope series you know full of action full of you know um crazy events that went down in mexico in the 60s 70s and 80s that were right up there with medellin and cali you know medellin and cali the colombian cartels they get a lot of the attention and his you know the history is made into movies into shows into novelas etc you know pablo escobar is the king every little thing that he did in colombia is like in a movie or in a show and like that's how it should have been for narcos mexico you know felix gallardo had a lot of history along with caro quintero and ernesto fonseca these two characters these two people they're still alive they were bosses they were they were millionaires they were uh, they controlled a lot of you know the government and they made them seem like basically like dumbass lackeys you know working for felix but each man, even even El Azul, El Azul is portrayed as a DFS agent, but in reality, El Azul was a, a big-time marijuana trafficker. He was up there with Caro Quintero and Don Neto, you know, um, growing weed in Chihuahua, in Zacatecas, in Sinaloa, in Sonora, all over the place. So El Azul in the 70s and 80s had a lot of pull and power, and, and, and he was a, a big-time trafficker in his own right. And um, I feel like he was just portrayed as a like a side character, you know, in the background, you know, getting, you know, punked by DFS agents. He's just kind of like an assistant, basically. But when the Guadalajara cartel was in its, you know, power, Fildes Gallardo, El Azul, Carlo Quintero, Don Neto, and even, you know, El Cochiloco. And uh, we'll talk about El Cochiloco in a little bit because that's another thing that I didn't like about the show. How they downplayed his role in all this all these men were like they formed a federation they formed a family back then they didn't call it a cartel it was just like a family a group a grupo de guadalajara you know like they controlled um organized crime in mexico they they ran everything from guadalajara you know they were all sinaloans they all went down there with operation condor you know that was shown in the show but a lot of things were wrong or they omitted a bunch of details. I don't know why. They downplay they downplayed a lot of events. They downplayed a lot of characters. Um, which is why I don't understand that, you know, when you watch Medellin and, and the Cali seasons for Narcos, each character is interesting. Like each character is doing his own thing. You know, you have Pacho Herrera, you have, you know, um, you know, all these other characters like Miguel Rodriguez Orejuela, his brother Gilberto, every single person in the Cali season is doing something. And then in, in Medellin, there's Pablo, there's Blackie, there's uh, Gustavo, his cousin, you know, there's Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha, there's Carlos Leader, you know, all these people that were all powerful men, all working for the Medellin cartel. But here in Me Narcos, Mexico, it seems like Felix Gallardo is just getting punked by the government, and he has these two lackeys. Uh, Don Neto and you know Rafa are working for him and Rafa's doing stupid shit and Don Neto is just like number two just kind of like you know in the shadows just like a yes man to Felix you know and that that was not the case at all all these men had you know political protection they they uh they had power they they owned the city of Guadalajara Guadalajara has like four million people it's like the second biggest city in Mexico like they own the entire city and the state 
the state police, the federales, the Mexican army, the DFS, they owned all these branches of government. They all protected them. They worked for them. But in the show, it seems like the narcos are trying to do their business, but they keep getting punked by the federales. They keep getting punked by the DFS. They keep on getting like extorted, you know, the, the, the director of the DFS, whoever he was in the show. Felix actually ends up, you know, spoiler alert, but Felix kills him because this guy is asking for a lot of money. But in reality, the director of the DFS, Sorrilla Perez, his name was Jose Antonio Sorrilla Perez. He was the director of the DFS. And um, he protected Felix, you know, like he, he, he gave the, the group, the Guadalajara cartel, a bunch of uh, credentials and, you know, you know, badges, you know, so they could go around Mexico and impede it, you know. With a DFS badge, it's basically like if you were a drug dealer in L.A. or San Francisco, Oakland, Baltimore, wherever, and you walked around with a fucking CIA badge, an FBI badge, and if you're driving around and the police stop you, all you got to do is just flash your badge and like, hey, I'm on the job, I'm CIA, I'm uh, FBI, you know, leave me alone, and they would leave you alone because, you know, there's jurisdictions and shit. And that's what basically what these narcos did in Mexico. They went around acting like they were cops. And not only cops, they were intelligence. Like, they were members of the intelligence agency in Mexico. The, to- the secret police, you know? Nobody fucked with these guys. The DFS didn't fuck with them. Even though they weren't D- DFS agents, the DFS protected them. Caro Quintero and Don Neto and Felix Gallardo, they would drive around the city. Wherever they were, they would drive around. And there'd be like three or four cars of DFS agents armed to the teeth, just, you know, fucking following them or, or, or driving in front of them, providing escort, you know? But in the show, it shows that the DFS is just like, uh, you know, like basically running the show when these dumbass narcos from Sinaloa come to Guadalajara and set shop. And, you know, they're getting extorted by the governor of Sinaloa, they're getting extorted by the DFS. And Felix is just basically a dumbass who doesn't know what he's doing. But, you know, this show was set in 1980, I believe. But by 1980, Felix Gallardo had several uh, arrest warrants. Because he had been trafficking cocaine and heroin for years. <laughs> he started off as a, as a bodyguard for Governor uh, Sanchez Celis in Sinaloa. And by being the, the bodyguard of the governor assigned to the governor's mansion, he met Pedro Aviles. Which uh, we see in the show. And I don't like how they portrayed him either. Because Pedro Aviles was the, the pioneer, the godfather of the drug trade. Everybody who's somebody in the drug trade learned from Pedro Aviles. They either worked for him, they either, you know, learned from him. He either, you know, uh, he was their godfather, he made them, he trained them, he, you know, he taught them everything they know. So all these people that are narcos now, you know, El Chapo, they say that El Chapo was related to Pedro Aviles. That was like his uncle or something. Uh, Caro Quintero uh, worked with Pedro Aviles in his field. Don Neto was his treasurer. Felix Gallardo w- worked with him as well, you know, uh, connecting Pedro with, you know, government officials in Sinaloa. El Azul was a, was a good friend of Pedro Aviles. El Cochiloco was his compadre. They were best friends. They all worked together. So anybody who's anybody learned from Pedro Aviles. But in the show, they show Pedro Aviles to be like this ignorant hick who doesn't see the big picture and you don't you don't get to be a boss and control the drug trade by being a dumbass but that's basically how the show made it seem like it was a bunch of idiots who didn't know what to do who grew marijuana but then felix came along and introduced everybody to cocaine and then all of a sudden hey we're a cartel we're millionaires now that's that's not how it works these people have been knowing the business since like the 30s the 40s the 50s the 60s so, yeah, that's that's part one of my video, you know, we're discussing Narcos Mexico. If you guys have any, any pet peeves or if you noticed anything, like, you know, I bet you a lot of guys who are going to watch this video, or people, girls, even girls, you guys know about the narco history and you watch the show. And it was entertaining, I admit, but, I mean, they got a lot of things wrong. There was a lot of missed opportunities. This, this uh, series could have been great, but I guess it just came off as okay because... A lot of the stories that they showed in season one could have easily been two or three seasons. I understand, you know, it takes a while, you know, to talk about the Mexican trade. They want to talk about El Chapo, they want to talk about the Arellano, so naturally it's going to be like three seasons. But Guadalajara alone, like to 
completely tell the true story of the Guadalajara cartel and like what Caro Quintero, what Felix Gallardo, and what Don Neto used to do, and you know Pedro Avilés, Cochiloco, all of them. You really do need like two two seasons to completely, you know, one season could have been you know the origins and the the power of the cartel. Season two could have easily been like the what led up to the kidnapping of Camarena and Zavala. And then season three could have been like the aftermath and then the rise of, of you know, the Arellano Felix brothers, Amado Carrillo in Chihuahua, um, Chapo Guzman and Guero Palma over in Sinaloa, you know, El Mayo, Baltasar Diaz, all of them. All these, all these people were, were drug lords, like with a lot of pull, but a lot of them don't get no, you know, recognition. Nobody even knows about them, you know. So if you guys have any comments... Or if you want to, you know, you want to offer some feedback or, you know, you agree with what I said or you disagree or whatever, you know, just leave it in the comments. If you have any ideas of what I, of any topics that I should discuss or, you know, stuff that you guys want to know about or hear about, you know, I'll, I'm more than willing to make videos and, you know, to discuss all that stuff with you guys. And, um, yeah, I'll be uploading these videos like every Friday, I believe, if I have time. You know, I will have time, of course. Each week it's going to be a different topic. Um, I'm planning on talking about Lamberto Quintero, the true story about Lamberto Quintero. A lot of Mexicans know his corrido, you know, but not a lot of people know about his real story, you know. We're going to be talking about Caro Quintero, of course, you know. Uh, Chapo Guzman, we're going to talk about Felix Gallardo and his beginnings and his, you know, his actual story. Don Neto, we're going to be talking about all the old school players back in the day. Um, people you've never heard about, Modesto Zuna, Roberto Alvarado, Ruben Cavada. You know, um, all the people, all the cats from Sinaloa who, who were narcos back in the day, you know, like, and they ended up dying young. You know, like Culichi. Um, so if you guys have any ideas, you know, feel free to drop them in my comments and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you for listening.